Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. We started thinking about that in 2006. And, and that's the biggest logistical challenge. You definitely can't like write up, you know? Oh, no way. No, oh, I love it. Okay, we got to do it. What's up? Oh, that sounds yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, let's get a beer. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't believe we're going to get a tower dog. Yeah, okay. So, so we're going to have some plans. Yeah. And Wednesday. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Dave, how's the eyebrow doing? It's uh, pretty good. Yeah. Do you get a good scar or no? Uh, no, I think it's going to go away All right, let those drivers come in. Um, so I'm Sarah Hagel, if you can't tell by just my eyes or if you haven't seen me for a while. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jonathan Armstrong. He's uh, from Oregon State University, the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. So these are like us. Um, and uh, grew up in Southern Oregon, so one time Oregonian. Um, spending his time in Cascade and Siskiyou Mountains. He did his undergrad at Lewis and Clark, and then did his PhD at the University of Washington. Uh, and then he did a Smith Fellows postdoc at the University of Wyoming. And so for you grad students, if you're into conservation, uh, into science communication, uh, check out the Smith Fellows program. Uh, some opportunities there. He's published a number of papers. I don't know how many dozens of papers on cell monitors at this point, and um, also some about cell monitors and bears. So, for my 5 to 70 species over here, species interactions from the Cascades. Uh, also, a co author on Schindler et al., the portfolio effect, which we're going to go over next Wednesday in 5 to 70. So, um, that'll be great for my students here. Uh, and he strives to push the boundaries of scientific knowledge in ways that tangibly benefit conservation. He's also big into science communication, so grad students who are into uh, having impact and communicating, join us afterwards at Downward Dog, about the study, about its strategies for tangible benefits in science communication. Um, and he says that his free time, he enjoys chasing his children, and he and I just talked about our little daughter's mountain biking, Shredding it up, and he likes to go surfing with Dave Lytle. So, not like me surfing, talk about that. <laughs> awesome, sounds good. Well, thanks a bunch for the intro, and thanks everybody for coming out. It's really fun to see new faces and to get to talk about the, the work that I do. So I was a little dishonest with my title today because it was about all about fish and hot and hypoxic habitats, but I thought kind of like um. You know how you, you're all excited for a concert, but first you got to see the um, opening band that wasn't necessarily in the flyer. Well, the opening act today is going to be about resource waves and how bears and other animals get fat eating um, salmon. So the, I'll talk about that and I'll get into those hot and hypoxic habitats that I promised in the title. I'm going to start with sort of a provocative question that is the overarching theme of this talk. Uh oh, my cursor's not working. I'm trouble getting the slides. Oh, here we go. All right. Um, Provoking question, how does a mouse work? Um, okay, so does conservation have a map problem? What do I mean by that? And it's not that I think that they make bad maps, but I do want to start by showing you my three favorite maps from Terrible Maps, the Twitter handle. So all three are awesome in their own ways. First, we have the geographic heterogeneity in denim color. 
I'm, I actually like, I'd say Oregon is my favorite denim color. The snow to wine index, which I can't decide that it's a good thing or a bad thing. And then I think a per, one of the most powerful just visual displays of American excellence, which is the geographic distribution of Super Bowl wins. Um, so, but while there are bad maps out there and I love them, that's actually not, I'm not saying that we don't make good maps in conservation because if you open any journal, if you open like nature or science these days, it seems like every issue has a new global distribution that's plotted, right? And they, they reflect really innovative analyses and, and tons of hard work and they're beautiful, dazzling displays. So I'm not knocking these maps by saying that they're like the Super Bowl one, but instead that every time we make a map, every, every time we show anything as a map, whether we mean to or not, we're making a decision, whether conscious or not, to show space at the expense of time. And usually everything that gets plotted on a map does have rich temporal patterns that we have to kind of sweep under the rug to just show it as a map. And sometimes this can mean that we end up overlooking important um, processes that play out over time. And here's an example that shows this. This is a paper from Sean Brennan that came out in Science. And he showed maps that are the kind of maps that as a salmon ecologist, I could only dream of getting a single version of, which is a spatially continuous, large scale map of salmon production in this big base in the Nishigak River in Alaska. And he showed it for both Chinook and Sockeye. And, and the key message that came out of this is that the maps look different depending on the year that you, that you made them. And it showed how sort of the productivity shifted across this landscape from year to year. So that having all these different parts of the landscape contribute over time resulted in a stable fishery. And you can imagine if you only had, you know, one map here like 2011, and you were trying to think about how you could be strategic and where you place a mine or something, you might think, oh, we'll just put something down there in the lower river, like um, it's not that productive. But then years later, that could be the critical habitat that keeps your fishery from closing. So the point here is that things can shift around. And if we have a single map, we can oftentimes, you know, not understand the processes that are playing out over time. So today I'm going to be giving two examples of this. But instead of thinking about interannual time scales and, and shifts over those longer time periods, I'm only talking about shifts that happen within a single year. And two examples and, and with that it kind of reflect conceptual new conceptual frameworks that I've helped work on with, with my collaborators. One of them is this idea of resource waves and how foraging opportunities can shift across landscapes for wide ranging animals like grizzly bears. And the second is the idea of growth regimes and how seasonal habitats combine to get animals through the year. So I know these are both kind of like jargony titles, but I promise I will fully unpack each one. Right, so I want to start with a current, I, was, I think this is a sporting event. It's one of my favorite sporting events of the year, but it's when I believe it's Katmai National Park that runs it and they award the Fat Bear Prize. And it's got, it gets global media attention and everybody looks at these bears that just get enormous eating salmon. And this was a, a before and after, usually they have cute names like Chubzilla and stuff like that, but this is just Bear 131. But I found this nice picture, I think in the Guardian, showing this bear's transformation from a little bear to a big chubby bear that's, that's well equipped to survive the long Alaska winter. And when they talk, and when the media covers this, and I think scientists as well, and we think about how do bears get so big? How do they put on so much weight? And, and why are there such huge populations of grizzly bears in Alaska? We think, well, it must be because of the abundance of salmon, because of the prolific salmon runs. And I wanna push back or refine that just a little bit in the first part of this topic. Because I think if we focus only on the abundance of salmon, then it follows that we should probably use salmon abundance then as a metric when prioritizing landscapes for conservation or for fisheries management and other, and other you know, allocation of limited resources. Or an argument that we see a lot is that we can evaluate the impacts of proposed land use based on the number of salmon in the footprint. So if there's not a lot of salmon there, well, I guess the impacts probably scale accordingly. So why is it that we might not just be able to use abundance alone? And the reason is because there's aspects of time involved with salmon and the foraging opportunity that they present to consumers that are really important. And salmon support about 50 different inland consumers when they come and spawn and die in freshwater ecosystems. But most of them like, like brown bears that prey and scavenge on salmon or these rainbow trout 
that eat their eggs. For, for, for many or most of these consumers, they can only access salmon when they're spawning. And spawning only lasts for about three to five weeks for a single population in a single portion of the landscape. So this is, while salmon are an incredibly abundant resource, they're also an incredibly ephemeral resource. And they represent this, this giant feast, a perfect timing for talking about this because next week is Thanksgiving. Um, and so time is really important and it's extra important for, for consumers like, like rainbow trout or like bears because they're different than squirrels. That's something that's intuitive, right? So anybody know what I mean by they're different than squirrels other than their body size? They store their energy internally, right? So they can't just hoard away salmon in like a cave and snack on it all winter. So if they're going to make a living eating salmon, they have to digestively process it and store it as fat. And that's a slow process that needs time. So three to five weeks just isn't enough time to put on, to, to, to get giant as a grizzly bear. So how do they do it? And the answer lies in the landscape. So just like down here, landscapes and, and watersheds in Alaska are incredibly heterogeneous. And this is just a, this, I don't know if you can capture it in a single, I took this picture when I was about to puke doing an um, aerial survey of salmon looking out the window. But you can kind of see just from this that there's really different habitats um, in Alaska. You have these kind of marshy um, lowland basins that drain ponds or muskegs. And then you might have uh, glacial streams and groundwater streams. So there's incredibly different hydrologies and different thermal regimes in these streams. So imagine the landscapes across which salmon spawn and bears eat salmon, they have really different hydrologies. So later in this talk, I'm gonna push back a lot on using maps of summer temperature, but I'm gonna use one right here. So this is a map of summer temperature in different streams where salmon spawn in the Wood River Basin. This is where I did my uh, PhD research with the Alaska Salmon Program and Daniel Schindler. So you can see streams vary. One thing that they all share is that you probably wouldn't be that psyched to go swimming in them. They're not that warm, but they range from being downright frigid to where I was doing all these spawning surveys and, uh, and my face just got like chapped within about a week from swimming in this stuff. I've probably done damage to my, to my uh, ears, but, um, and then they got to about maybe 13 to 15 degrees C is the warmest temperature. So, so, so why does this matter to bears and salmon? Well, um, my lab mate, Peter Lisi, and some other study, uh, studies have shown that stream temperature and the sort of ambient thermal environment is really closely related to salmon spawning phenology. Um, you can see here, there's like the warmer it is, the later they spawn. And there's probably two reasons for this. Um, one is that in the colder habitats, it takes the embryos longer to incubate. So imagine if, if all the populations want their eggs to emerge at the same time when the lake is the most productive, then they're gonna have to get their eggs in earlier in the colder populations. Another reason um, is probably because in the, warmer, in the warmer parts of the landscape, fish are also trying to avoid thermal stress. We know from a recent analysis, and there was a recent meta-analysis in, in science that showed that embryos and spawners are the most vulnerable um, life stage for fishes in terms of uh, thermal tolerance. So another hypothesis is that, that, the, that in the warmer parts of the landscape, fish wanna wait until after peak summer temperatures to get their eggs in the gravel. So there's probably multiple reasons that you get this relationship. Okay, so again, why does this matter to bears? Well, it's because, because of that relationship, if we make this map again for spawn timing, we can see it's an equally colorful map. And spawn timing occurs anywhere from, my favorite stream I think is Ice Creek, right here and spawning starts in early July. And then in some of the lakes, it doesn't get going until September because of that relationship between temperature and spawn timing. So what this means is that because of this phenological asynchrony at the scale of the entire watershed, salmon are around for three months instead of three weeks. So this greatly prolongs the availability of salmon. Now, if you're a sculpin, that might not matter, right? Because if you're, or a, a sculpin, I think move more than we give them credit, but maybe, maybe more up in, uh, to throw Dave a bone, a caddisfly larva. Um, if you're a caddisfly larva, you probably don't move around that much. This doesn't matter. But if you're something like a, a brown bear that can walk across the entire watershed in a day, then that means that at the scale of your potential seasonal home range, now salmon are around for much longer. But it only matters if you can surf this resource wave and track this sort of shifting mosaic of food across the landscape. 
And this, this idea of animal surfing resource waves, um, it doesn't just apply to salmon and bears, but there's been really cool work done on relationships, um, on consumers tracking phenological diversity in their prey. That includes Brianna Abram has some recent work on uh, blue whales. There's cool stuff on ungulates in uh, Africa, and then really neat stuff on fig wasps and, the, and their co-evolved uh, plant hosts. But we've, we've written a couple of papers, uh, conceptual, uh, so concepts, those, uh, those, you know, those really annoying chatty concepts and synthesis papers. We've written a couple of them about resource waves. Um, so the key question is, do bears and other consumers, do they actually surf these waves of salmon? Because they're cool, but they only actually prolong your foraging if you can surf those waves. Um, so I don't have time to go into them, but we have a, a variety of empirical studies um, that have confirmed that animals, including rainbow trout, uh, birds, I used to call them seagulls, but now, now they're glaucous wing gulls, um, and brown bears, there's, there's a variety of lines of evidence showing how they all track these resource waves and move from the cold streams where salmon spawn early to the warm streams where they spawn later. Um, and uh, Will Dacey was a postdoc in my lab, one of my first lab members here at OSU. And he had some cool work where they GPS collared um, bears on Kodiak Island and tracked them first to show that they surf those waves of salmon. And then working with Charlie Robbins at WSU, um, we got hair samples from the bears that were collared. And you can actually use mercury as a, as a diet tracer for salmon. And we're able to show that the bears that surfed the wave better and fed on salmon for longer accumulated more mercury in their hair showing they were able to eat more salmon. So linking the, the, the benefit to the consumer with the behavior. Okay, so we know these critters surf salmon waves, but how can we, how can we take this work and, and make it more explicitly relevant to conservation? That was the next kind of challenge we faced. And this is something I did when I was doing that Smith Fellows uh, postdoc. So I went from working in the streams, you know, like seeing, seeing bears and counting salmon to staring at my computer, working on robot bears and simulation models. And that was less satisfying. Um, but it also, I think sometimes we need to turn to, to these sort of approaches to answer questions at the level to which they are relevant or to answer the questions that managers are asking, right? It's hard to do an observational study that's gonna compare the contribution of salmon abundance with uh, phenological variation because we can't necessarily do long-term research that spans huge contrasts in abundance and phenological variation. And we certainly can't manipulate these variables at the scales of landscapes. So I did some modeling. I'm gonna kind of go through, uh, ah, I got some time actually. Um, but we, we started with, a, with a, sam a portfolio of salmon populations, just like you would have a portfolio of salmon populations across a, a big watershed. And we, we base these loosely on the Wood River system because it's one of the most well-studied and sort of empirically parameterized uh, stock complexes uh, in the world. So we have about 80 salmon populations across this big basin and they spawn in small streams and then larger rivers and beaches. And the streams spawn earlier because they tend to be colder habitats. And um, so here's sort of a simplified example where we, where we, we did kind of ignore some of the uh, intra habitat type variation abundance, but we're, in this plot, I'm showing you just how we can manipulate phenological diversity and sort of the strength of that resource wave. So uh, this middle panel with like a, as a standard deviation and spawning phenology of 20 represents the Wood River system. And then we simulated there being more phenological variation, which could represent something like the Copper River Delta, where there's multiple species of salmon and incredible physiological or uh, physical diversity, so that salmon are spawning for six months or more of the year. And then a lower standard deviation could be something like Southeast Alaska, where much of the wild production of salmon has been replaced with hatchery production. So now you sort of have a genetically homogenous stock across much of the landscape. So we manipulated both phenological variation and the abundance of those salmon portfolios. So you can imagine we have two levers that we can sort of manipulate. So then we had to add bears in. So we created virtual bears that we set loose for the summer foraging on these salmon. And then we made rules for their behavior um, that were largely, a lot of it was, as much as we could, we based this on empirical data um, and you can see this, we have this beautiful, uh, or one of the graphs is hidden, but it's okay. But um, basically we simulated salmon coming and becoming available at spawning habitats. 
than bears feeding on those salmon, but being constrained by their, by their digestive capacity, which we know from some of Charlie Robbins labs work. And then some salmon dying and being able to be scavengeable and then salmon decomposing. So you can, so what I'm trying to kind of show here is we, we simulated this portfolio of salmon arriving and becoming available to bears. And then we saw how much they were able to eat. And so one of the key things that we were able to look at with this was sort of, you know, characterizing the relative importance of phenological variation compared to abundance. And what became clear is that phenological variation combines with salmon abundance to mediate the opportunities of bears. And there's this strong synergy between them where having that variation, that diversity, that is what unlocks the ability of big runs of salmon to feed bears because it's spreading that resource across time, right? So you can see here, it, it looks like a type two functional response, but you lift, lift up that asymptote when you have more phenological variation. Now, the second result that, that I wanna highlight from this is here we have this, we have the spawning phenology on the x-axis and then on the y, and then all the dots are different populations of salmon and their size represents how much abundance they had in the model. And then the y-axis is how much they contributed to the total consumption of bears divided by how abundant the population was. And the thing I'm trying to show in this plot is that the small populations of salmon that spawned early were disproportionately important to bears. Way more of these salmon end up in the stomach of bears on a per capita basis than the salmon in the beaches and rivers because partly because of the unique phenology and also because there's, as many studies have shown, they're more vulnerable to predation in these small streams. So the combination of those two factors, the vulnerability and phenology makes these small streams really important. Even if the salmon in those habitats aren't that abundant compared to the large rivers and lakes. And the reason why that matters is because it pushes back on this notion that we can evaluate ecological impacts based on the number of salmon in the footprint. And I, I keep bringing this up because if you looked at the, the draft EIS statements for the pebble mine, this was the, sort of how they evaluated whether, you know, whether some of the more severe parts of the footprint were gonna have a big impact on fisheries. And the argument was, well, this is only XX fraction of the total abundance of salmon lives in this footprint, why would it matter? But I think what this model shows, and in addition to the empirical studies is that these smaller streams that are more vulnerable to land use development, they might not have a huge fraction of the total watershed salmon in them. Yet, if you look at the fraction of time that bears can feed on salmon, these streams provide 50% roughly in the Wood River system of the total time bears can eat, on, eat salmon, even if they only contribute on average like 15 to 20% of the total abundance of salmon on the landscape. And, and, uh, and then the last point I just wanna make about this is that if accounting for, for this behavior and for phenological diversity, this resource waste phenomena, it can change the way that we evaluate you know, potential pressures on landscapes. And just a few, you know, these are some of the dominant pressures right now in, in coastal watersheds of Alaska. You know, proposal for mines like the pebble mine, uh, fisheries, they're sustainable, but they still um, harvest a huge fraction of, of the total run that's going inland. And small, uh, small populations that are less productive can be over harvest. That's just part of um, maximum sustainable yield on stock aggregates. And then hydropower and hatcheries. But for example, with something like a hatchery, um, accounting for resource waves can let us more accurately understand how that might affect ecosystems than just thinking about abundance because you know, you, sometimes you can replace wild production with hatchery production and not change abundance. All right, uh, I don't know if anybody has the new PowerPoint, but every time you make a slide, it gives you like an alternative suggested design option. I like to use it whenever I can. That was, that was one of my first times I've ever done animations in a PowerPoint. You can tell everyone's blown away. You look just speechless. So I wanna shift gears now and talk about the same idea of how do conditions change, how do spatial patterns change over time and how do animals exploit that shifting habitat mosaic? But now I wanna be talking about cold water fish in the context of climate change adaptation. All right. So in addition to the work I did on resource waves, I did some stuff on, most of my graduate work was about uh, behavioral thermal regulation and how fish can move around between cold and warm habitats to optimize their physiology. So I was really jazzed on thermal heterogeneity um, 
when I came down to the lower 48 and started working in Oregon. And I noticed that, that people were super psyched on thermal heterogeneity here too, and that particularly uh, thermal mapping was just light years ahead of what I was doing in, a, in my um, PhD and postdoc work, in the sense that uh, efforts like the Norwest model were creating uh, maps of entire portions of the United States showing spatially continuous maps of water temperature. And these were being these were incredibly influential in fields like climate adaptation because they're, they're one of the only tools or source of information that's available for every basin. So they're oftentimes the first thing that managers look at or the first time, thing that, that conservation scientists look at when thinking about adaptation. One of the things that really struck me is that um, people, when thinking about um, what to do, or, you know, when interpreting thermal heterogeneity, um, it wasn't like, oh, cool, there's, there's cold water and there's warm water. It was more like, where's the good stuff and where's the bad stuff? And I think this is per perfectly encapsulated in this blog post from the Climate Aquatics blog here from the developers of the Norwest model, where they, next to this image, they show this idea for cold water fishes as the blue parts of the map being heaven and the red parts being um, PG-13 rated heck. Um, and so, and, and this isn't something I just saw, you know, like, um, and, 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 and of course I really respect this work and, and the incredible tool that these maps provide, but I, but I was a little surprised by this and also surprised that like when I came down here and started having conversations with managers and like leadership at agencies, I saw a much, you know, this same kind of view, but even stronger. And, and hearing folks say things like, we just need to make our last stand at cold water. We need to find the cold water, make our last stand there. A really strong sense that, that cold water is what's good for, for cold water fishes, which is, I gotta admit is pretty intuitive. And so this is an example of the, what, I would, what I think is pretty clearly the dominant uh, sort of framework for cold water fish climate change adaptation. And here's what I'm gonna push back on in the second part of this talk. So the idea here is that you start with maps of summer temperature, specifically maps of August temperature. And, and, and next to that map, I just, that's a cartoon map with some real data from the planet base next to it. But just showing that you, that you take, you know, entire seasonal patterns of water temperature and you just look at the snapshot of summer. And in fact, in these models, you look at, you actually look at just August temperatures. So it's, it's even a narrower snapshot. And then what you do is you crowdsource data on fish distributions and you relate August temperature to fish occupancy to find the thresholds at which species are no longer present. And from that, you identify climate refugia and therefore you you, you decide what's valuable and what's not in the climate context. And so what this does is it systematically devalues the downstream portions of watersheds. And I, and, and I gotta admit, like I read this at first and I thought, um, well, it seems pretty logical, if, you know, if, these are the, if there's these thresholds and you don't find fish past those thresholds, like then shouldn't we just write off places that are too warm? But one of my first um, graduate students, she did a literature review of the timing of field work for work on juvenile salmonids. Um, and she found what I think probably everyone in the room would probably guess, which is that most field work goes on in summer and most seasons, most field studies only last one season, right? So most, if you go crowdsource information on where the distribution of fish is, what you're getting is, is, is August occupancy versus August temperatures. So you're finding out what habitats fish use in the summer and making conclusions on that when you don't necessarily know what, what how habitats function during the remainder of the year. So working with um, a variety of co-authors um, here in, mostly here in Corvallis, we developed an alternative conceptual framework for trying to think about seasonality and temperature across landscapes. And so incorporating both seasonality and animal movement. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna briefly describe that uh, framework next. Um, so we just had this paper come out and what, what we wanted to do is take the idea of regimes in rivers, which talk about the spatial and temporal distribution of habitat conditions and translate that into not just physical variables, but biological variables. So we, we, we started thinking about the, what is the growth regime of rivers? How, how are the physio physiological opportunities for cold water fish patterned in space and time? So we start here just for this, for kind of introducing this concept, I'm just gonna have like a two patch model where we have a warm main stem and cold tributaries. So in the warm, say we had a, 
a thermal performance curve of a fish, which we've I've, I've put on that right panel and tilted it. So say that temperature optimum was about 15 degrees C, which is often the case for, um, for salmonids. So what you can see here is the warm habitat is exceeding that in summer and the cold habitat isn't. So now if we simply take the thermal regime, uh, what I do? All right, we're back. Um, if you take the thermal regime and just plug it through a thermal performance curve that you can get from like a bioenergex models or, or, or lab studies, now you get the seasonal patterning of physiological performance, or here it's the uh, physiological scope for growth. So it's, this is very simple stuff, but I think an important thing emerges. You start with just two sine waves, but then one of them sort of exhibits this bimodal pattern throughout the year instead of being unimodal. Um, I'm sure there's probably a better technical term, but this beats what I was using before, which was the double humped camel versus the single humped camel. Um, but so, so why does this matter? And so I think there's two, two things that emerge, emerge that, that, are, that are important from this, even this very simple conceptual example. So one is that across a landscape, there's three peaks in physiological performance for cold water fish like trout and salmon. And only two of them occur in those tributaries that we place so much value on. And secondly, what this helps us see is that if we're evaluating landscapes through the lens of summer, we're seeing them when, when they're at their best for tributaries and when they're at their worst for the main stem. So, you know, if we, so this just, just adds that we probably wouldn't expect fish distributions in August to, to reflect fish distributions the rest of the year. Because, because you can see the, the, the physiological opportunities in these different habitats are like very asynchronous over time. And one's getting way better as the other one's getting worse. So we can also, um, so that was an example of showing these, these patterns explicitly through space and just show, or through time and just showing space as two lines. But now I wanna give space a better treatment and show how spatial patterns and physiological performance or growth potential, how they shift through the year. So some really important work by uh, McNeese et al that is often overlooked. They were able to, create some of the first year round maps of stream temperature. And this is one of the maps they made for the, or this is a, a, our analysis of one of the maps. So this is for the John Day Basin in, in Eastern Oregon. And what they did is they took satellite data of land surface temperature. And then with a bunch of temperature loggers, they were able to create a model where they could basically, every time the satellite flew over, they could predict temperatures across the whole landscape. So they got weekly landscape maps of temperature. So literally a movie of temperature instead of a map. So we took that movie and plugged it into an energetics model for bull trout and asked, what do the spatial patterns of growth potential look like over the course of the year? And you can just see really clearly in, in the seasonal maps that the patterns change dramatically. So in the winter, it's better downstream. And then that pattern just sort of magnifies itself in the spring. But then the high growth potential, the yellow, sort of starts to propagate up the watershed and ends up only in the tributaries and then goes back down. So this longitudinal pattern flips directions twice. And as you can see in the summer, there's a picture of my daughter. Um, if you visit the John Day in the summer, clearly if you go downstream, it looks like it's a place that is only good for taking your five-year-old bass fishing. It doesn't look like cold water fish habitat. But what this shows is that um, at other seasons, these habitats look great. And, and one thing that I think pulls this figure together and kind of shows the, the significance of it is if we plot the year round variation in the area of habitat across this landscape that's expressing thermally optimal temperatures for cold water fish. I know that's kind of a mouthful. What, it, what that means is what fraction of the landscape or how much of the landscape is 10 to 16 degrees C, which is you know, approximately optimal um, for cold water fishes. And what you can see is during much of the year, not much of it is optimal. Right in winter, it's too cold everywhere, and in summer, it's too hot everywhere, but in the tributaries. So that does emphasize the the critical importance of of cold tributary habitat. But then, if you look at the spring and the fall, you can see that there's these huge pulses in the area of optimal habitat. And what this gets across is that if we if we overlook if we just look at tributaries and we and we overlook 
the, the places that aren't perennially optimal or perennially suitable for cold water fish that we're writing off just a, a huge fraction of the, of the total, you know, growth or a, I don't know the best jargony phrase for this, but the, of the sort of total expression of physiological, physiologically optimal habitat. In other words, you're just cutting way down on the intrinsic potential for riverscapes to support cold water fish. Got to remember to say it that way next time. Um, and here's, here's one more figure I'm going to show you from that analysis. Here, um, this is the proportion of a watershed that's 10 to 16 degrees C. So approximately optimal for cold water fishes. And this is for three basins. And it's showing you in 2012, a more typical year versus 2015, which was that extreme drought year that was perhaps replaced by 2021, but we don't have data for that yet. But what you can see here is that there was a sort of unimodal pattern where the where just you get more better and better habitat as the summer warms and then it cools down. But things became way more bimodal in 2015. This just shows you how the growth regimes of river are gonna change. And I think we oftentimes focus on, well, how, what are we gonna do about summer? And that's obviously really important. But I think this also shows how we're gonna get other changes like more and more of the physiological opportunities for fish are gonna happen earlier in spring and later in fall. And we should be thinking, how, you know, what food sources are going to be available then? Where are they going to be available? How are we going to get fish to benefit and store energy during these times so they can make it to those times? And you might think, well, shouldn't we know? Shouldn't we know how fish, you know, um, shouldn't we know more about the foraging ecology of fish in different seasons and how they link together habitats? But again, going back to Megan's uh, thesis, this is that literature review, and this is the number of seasons that were studied in different publications. And you can see overall, only 8% of studies have year-round data, which I think anyone, anyone who, who's, who's uh, doing their thesis work or anyone who's tried to find housing for your technicians knows that it's brutal trying to do year-round work. Um, and even as even that's like the defining feature of my lab group, I'm like, why am I doing year-round work? This is brutal. So, but my key point here is that we fundamentally don't understand the annual cycle for cold water fishes, what fish do year round, what trophic pathways support them and, and, and things like interseasonal interactions and carryover effects. We just, our existing knowledge because of its, of its sort of temporal attributes don't let us understand these questions as well as we'd like to. So with, one of the things our lab group is trying to do is close that knowledge gap of how fish move across landscapes over the course of the year and, and how different habitats combine to support them. And one of the places where we're really doing this is the upper Klamath basin. Um, I think I grew up like right there. So this is actually pretty close to where I grew up in Southern Oregon. And I have two different PhD students that have worked down there, Nick Hallbeck and Jordan Ortega. And this is a basin that I'm really excited about for a variety of reasons, but one is because it just has so much very spatial heterogeneity in, in just the condition, habitat conditions and hydrologies. So one attribute that varies is summer temperature. Um, like I said, the Norwest uh, map of summer temperatures can be very useful for understanding spatial heterogeneity. And, and here's an example of that. You have these little blue mountain tributaries that are cold year round and then scorching hot main stems. Um, the Sprague River that I'm gonna talk about today a little bit later, I think it hit 29 degrees C during that heat wave last summer. So up into the lower eighties, but then also there's really cold parts of this landscape like up in the Sky Lakes wilderness or, or, the, or the tributaries that come off the Rim of Crater Lake. And in addition to temperature, other gradient, other physiological or physical variables like productivity and gradient are incredibly variable. I love this picture. This kid's gonna find out that I use it someday and sue me. I stole this off Google images, but, uh, this is, so Upper Klamath Lake dominates the basin and it's, it's historically eutrophic, but it's now hyper eutrophic because of nutrient loading. And it turns just neon green for like four months of the year. It's algae production, it's, it's cyanobacteria, but um, it's so intense that there's commercial harvesting of it. I think that's probably what that barge is in the background and it's wild. And so anyways, the, the reason why this landscape is so, why I think it's so neat is that um, it has a mix of the type of habitats that we think of as being perfect for cold water fishes, like those spring habitats shown there. But it's also got places that we would never think of as contributing to cold water fisheries. 
like this hypereutrophic lake that gets into the upper 20s every summer. So we're trying to understand how all these different habitats, whether they play roles and what roles they play in supporting red band trout. And this is just some quick um, plots to just show the extreme variation. The lake is shown in red there. You can see, I think that those must be average daily temperatures because they don't look that high, but it gets very hot in the summer, whereas surrounding habitats are more mild that have groundwater influence. And then this is my favorite. This is pH in the lake during summer. It gets above 10 because photosynthesis is cranking so hard and making it alkaline. And then there's also um, serious hypoxia events associated with bloom crashes. And then also just huge dial swings in DO because of photosynthesis. So incredible variation, but of course the lake is, is uh, at least in, in, until recently it froze in most years. So it's, there's just huge seasonality. So the first uh, species that we focused on is red band trout. And part of the reason is that they're, they're just really cool fish. And the other reason is that um, they're the last remaining fishery for the Klamath tribes after the collapse of uh, endemic suckers in the lake and the construction of dams in the in main stem Klamath that are actually slated to come out. And also they support an um, important uh, recreational fishery. So I'm gonna tell you about a study now that was uh, my first PhD student, Nick Halbeck's uh, first thesis chapter. And so we tagged a hundred red band trout. You can see one, one of these fish here and they're, they're roughly the size of like a coho salmon. They get giant down there. And so um, we placed a hundred, we re-tagged a hundred fish during the spring and we were mostly able to get fish in the lakes. And so we released a hundred fish in the lake and then we tracked them for three years. And we found that in summer that virtually no fish were in the lake. Only one radio tag was found in the lake in the summer and I'm pretty sure it was one that a fish shed um, and that was just malfunctioning. But they were instead in the surrounding habitats that we think of as being suitable, like high quality trout habitats. So, and these are all places that I recommend that you visit in the summer. Um, these are all beautiful places to get, take a canoe or a stand up paddleboard or something like that. This is a beautiful spring fed uh, marsh at the base of the Cascades in Pelican Bay, the Lower Williamson River, which the TNC has done some restoration on, and the Wood River Delta. So these are these surrounding habitats that are these big kind of chunks of cool or cold water habitat. That's where all of our fish were found. And, and many of them moved long distances, like over 40 kilometers to get to these summer habitats. And one thing that was interesting about this is that I have other students in the lab that are working on, on summer movements and thermal refuge behavior, but we've yet to see such a coherent movement across the population. For example, I thought I'd share this one because it's local. Hannah's studying, um, and she's working with Gabriel, who's in, who's in here, her undergraduate assistant, studying seasonal movements of cutthroat trout in the Willamette. So right here in Corvallis, we tagged like 107 fish around between Corvallis and Harrisburg, and only like 7% of them moved to cold water refuges during the summer. And steelhead in the Columbia have a lot of individual variation in whether they move to thermal refuges, but the Klamath Red Band, it was entirely coherent across the population. And if you look at the body temperatures of fish during the summer, you can see they're much lower than that of the lake because they're in those groundwater influenced habitats around the lake. So I've kind of spoiled my, the key takeaway from this already, but the point is that if you look through the lens of the summer in the upper climate basin, no fish are in the lake, not a single one, except for that one shed tag, I think. They're all in cool habitat. And you can see here, if you have the body temperatures of the fish, like we did from these temperature transmitting radio tags, they're mostly transmitting about, you know, somewhere around 15 degrees C, much cooler than the lake. So you think that the lake, through the lens of summer, the lake looks worthless. And it's what you'd expect because who would ever think that that neon green hyper eutrophic lake would be rearing habitat for a cold water fish. But now I'm gonna show you spring, summer and fall distributions based on radio tracking. And what you can see here is that in spring and fall, the lake was actually the most used habitat by these fish. And it's probably, we didn't have, you know, perfect detection efficiency. And I would argue this pattern is probably much, it's probably stronger than it looks here just because it's, it's harder to find fish in the lake. Um, but so the key point here is that we replicated the results that are used to write off seasonally warm habitat. We found all our fish below a, a threshold temperature of about 18 degrees C during summer. We only found them in big chunks of cold water. But if we looked at the rest of the year, they were in the lake. And what were they doing in the lake? 
they were absolutely gorging themselves on forage fish. And one really cool thing about Upper Klamath Lake is it has a ton of endemics and they love eating the endemic marbled sculpin. Um, that was a surprise for us. The almost endemic blue chub and then the sort of more widely dispersed to each other. Those are their, some of their favorite things to eat. And I've, I've puked other things that you think of as being a piscivore. That's really the only like nuanced skill I have in fisheries is puking fish. And like things like bass and pike, most of them have empty stomachs. These are voracious piscivores, but the occasional one finally ate a bunch of fish. But e virtually every single red band we've ever puked in the lake has had one or more fish in its stomach. And, th and these fish are just, they're, it's an incredibly productive foraging habitat for these fish. And these are just different metrics showing, uh, showing the diet energetics of fish when they're in the lake during spring and fall versus when they're on refuges in the summer. And you can see their diet switches to being dominated by fish. Their ration size is dramatically lower in summer than it is in spring and fall. And phase angle, which is a bioelectrical impedance uh, indicator of, of energetic uh, status that declines in the summer. So all these different lines of evidence collectively show that these fish are, are forging and growing like crazy in spring and fall, and they're just sliding through during the summer. But there's one, there's one panel that's missing here because it was harder to track fish, but we have information on it and that's winter. So these fish do a second uh, long distance migration when they leave the lake, this time not for thermal refuge, but for spawning. And they're actually starting to do it right now. Um, if you haven't, I'd really strongly encourage folks to go down there, go somewhere like Spring Creek or Collier State Park. Um, you can see these giant red band trout doing what they're doing in that picture, which is spawning in these gin clear springs. So this movement um, is a longer distance movement and they go right to the head of springs to spawn. And I've even seen in, in this picture here, at this spring, I even saw eggs like in a spring, like popcorn, like popping up. I don't know what that fish was thinking, but um, the point. Um, but so interesting. These are the, now they're going right to springs and they're going longer distances. And one of the things that really shocked us is that one of our most popular spawning sites is at a place called um, Beatty Gap. It's like halfway to Lakeview, so it's almost a I think it's about a hundred miles upstream of the lake. So they're using really distant habitats, and this is all really warm, impacted river in between Beatty Gap and the lake. So that was a surprise to us and our collaborators, which I forgot to mention, which are uh, ODFW, the Klamath Tribes, Wild Salmon Center, and Trout Limited. So key thing that this showed us is that not only do fish like combining cold and warm habitat, but it took them two different types of cold water habitat to get through the annual cycle. And this was just for adults. We don't even know about juveniles yet, right? So these are the summer refuge habitats in purple. And those are the spawning habitats in green. So they're using cold habitat for spawning and for summer refuge, but they're, they're totally different types of habitat in different parts of the landscape. But the key thing that our key point of the study is that while obviously the perennially cool habitats are critical because they get them through summer and they support spawning, we found that fish were in negative energy balance when they were doing all the stuff they do on cold water and that all their positive energy balance was coming from that seasonally extreme lake habitat. And we did these estimates of energetics based on water temperature and how much food was in fish's stomachs for the three seasons that we were able to sample fish diets. And then for spawning, we just estimated that based on literature values for the cost of reproduction. They usually, usually fish burn up about 15 to 25% of their energy stores when they spawn. Okay, so, um, now we're shifting now now we're trying to learn more about the rest of the life cycle because this was just for those large body adults and one of the key questions one of the first things we asked was if if these fish are spawning way up at baby gap at the top of this impacted um really hot uh sprague river how are how are their uh juveniles able to rear in that environment what are they how are they emerging in a sea of warm water and able to survive so um so jordan who's pictured in that uh, image did a riverscape survey looking at um, the abundance of age zero red band trout across that whole river. And he found there's, as you'd expect, there's a big hot spot um, up where they spawn at Beatty Gap where there's a bunch of springs. So they're both close to where they were born. And there's like high quality, um, you know, spring fed habitat that doesn't get as hot. But what we were all shocked about 
was the second peak in abundance that was way downstream in one of the warmest parts of the Sprague River in the Chiloquin Canyon, which is pictured here. And so we're trying to understand now why is it that, that this habitat is so important for, and, or hosts such a large number of these fish. And we think it is because of dissolved oxygen and the combined effects, the way that temperature and dissolved oxygen interact to, to determine thermal stress on, on fish. Um, and so to, I don't have time to go into too much detail. So I'm just gonna show you this figure. So this, the red line here is the dial variation in dissolved oxygen in this canyon where we find the fish. And the black line shows you upstream of the canyon in the low gradient habitat that dominates the Sprague River. What you can see is both of them get higher in the day because of photosynthesis, but respiration causes the DO to crash in the non-turbulent habitats. So it appears that these fish need these, these heavily um, turbulent habitats to maintain dissolved oxygen through the night. And so Jordan got a grant from the um, Climate Science and Adaptation Center, a fellowship to continue this work. And we're gonna keep mapping temperatures and, and try to understand the association between red band trout and oxygen better. And um, I probably shouldn't be saying, oh yeah, this is a good thing to say at the end of your talk. So I, I, I'm super um, motivated to, to try to take our understanding of dissolved oxygen to the understanding that we have, to the level that we understand water temperature. And of course, I don't want to do it on my own because I can barely figure out how to calibrate a dissolved oxygen meter. But um, I really think that we, that as we're increasingly understanding the spatial and, and temporal patterning of temperature, there's just this widening mismatch between our understanding of temperature and our understanding of oxygen. And even basic things just like general longitudinal trends or, or lateral patterns in, in dissolved oxygen, we don't always understand. So I have a few students who are, who are now trying to dive into dissolved oxygen. And I wanna share um, some of the work that Hannah and, and Gabriel have been doing on the Willamette River. I'll take a quick sip of water for this last one. So, um, so prior researchers at OSU, including uh, Stan Gregory and Stephen Lancaster and his grad student, um, Carolyn Gombert, they started working on these floodplain alcoves and showing that some of them have cold water. And it's caused by subsurface flows that go down, that go under and then, and then come up. And they've been down long enough that they're, that they're cool relative to the surface flows. And we've been doing a variety of work trying to understand how cutthroat trout use these habitats. And we've been finding they eat uh, diving uh, water beetles and coronamid pupa. Um, but what I want to talk about now is, is how temperature and oxygen can constrain them on these habitats. So this is an example of a temperature and oxygen vertical profile in one of these uh, alcoves. This is uh, one that's in between Irish Bend and Peoria. And you can see here that, that uh, if you could look behind that thing, you can probably imagine where it goes, that, that DO and temperature kind of track each other. So where it's cold, it's also hypoxic. And this is known in fisheries as, as the temperature oxygen squeeze where fish want to, want to find cold water because they're thermally stressed, but the only places that are cold are also low in, in dissolved oxygen. But usually it's studied at really big scales, like at, at, at reservoirs or in the ocean. And so we're trying to understand how fish deal with it at, at these sort of microhabitat scales. And so if you looked at this, at this image, um, you might think, well, they, they, they probably hang out at the thermocline. Our first hypothesis was that they'd hang out at the thermocline because it's where, the, where that sort of that trade-off is, is sort of um, balanced the best. And so, oh yeah, I forgot this little diagram. So our hypothesis was that they would, um, you can, Hannah did these, these fine animations. I played no role in, uh, in doing this. But we hypothesized that, that they would hang out at the thermocline. And we, we have just killed ourselves trying to show this. We, um, first we tried to do a bunch of video, stereoscopic video stuff, but the summer we did it, there were algae blooms and uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't get good quality video. Then we borrowed this insanely expensive sonar unit that just, I think I probably shaved years off my life worrying about breaking this thing. It was like a $100,000 uh, thing, but it just didn't quite work. But now we think we've been able to, to figure this out using a, do anybody have a thermopen for cooking meat? So th that company, they sell like research grade ones that have external probes that are just tiny little needles that can instantaneously measure temperature using a thermocouple. So we basically use one of those, um, we've been using one of those 
Oh, I forgot this. I'm going to show you this video really quick. Cause this is our, this is our hypothesis. And, and part of the reason that we, we came to this hypothesis is because we observed cutthroat trout in these off channel units being sort of um, lined up and, and this is sped up 30 times. And you can see these fish kind of holding along this, this specific layer. And when, when we went swimming around in this habitat unit, this is where this alcove spilled out into the Willamette. This kind of tracked where the sort of upper extent of where cold water was. So that led to our hypothesis. So what we're doing now is taking our little mini thermal pen and we're shocking fish. And then immediate, because you can get them so quickly with a boat shocker, we can shock them immediately, get an internal temperature on the fish and then compare it to a vertical profile to, to assess the depth of those fish. But as we started to do that, um, you know, we, we put temp uh, oxygen and temperature loggers out and we started to, you know, understand what we probably should have understood from the beginning, which is that there's incredible temporal variation, especially at die yield time scales in oxygen and temperature, but in, particularly in oxygen. So blue here is DO. You can see just these huge swings. It's going between really stressfully hypoxic and then fairly oxygenated on a daily basis. It's becoming oxygenated from photosynthesis during the day. In addition to the, you know, um, the diel and, and, and sort of um, episodic trends in temperature. So we've been asking, well, how do they, you know, the, the use of the thermocline would represent kind of what they maybe do at a specific period of the day when we were observing them, but how do they deal with this, you know, incredibly dynamic trade-off between temperature and oxygen? And so, um, and particularly how do they, so this is just plots for one. This is just, these, these uh, profiles are just for the bottom, right? So we're interested in how do they avoid hypoxia and thermal stress by potentially hopping between the curves on the bottom and on the surface. So what, what we've been, the way we've, you know, it's, in theory, it should be easy to figure this out, but in practice, it was hard. And so we think we've gotten it now by using enclosures. And this is, this is the only picture I could get uh, that I had gotten from hand that I could find in my texts. But uh, this is a prototype of our enclosure. We basically, uh, Hannah working with Gabriel, they built this big net column and we put cutthroat trout in this net column. And the reason we wanted to do that is because then we could eliminate lateral headers in 80 and we could put loggers and know exactly what the thermal profile is where the fish is. So we could understand their vertical movements and not and know exactly what the um, temperature oxygen profile was. So we put them in these big columns and we, we put temperature loggers, we hacked into I buttons and miniaturized them and put them on the outside of the fish. So we would know that you know, every few minutes we'd know exactly what the temperature was and, 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 and where they were. And if we had a chain of um, temperature and oxygen loggers based on the external temperature of the fish, we can know the depth and the dissolved oxygen of the environment that it was in. Is that I know I kind of rushed through that. And so we just did that in 2021 and the results are just coming in. But one of the really things that really sticks out right away is that the fish are doing dial vertical movements. And at night they move up in the water column to avoid hypoxia. So um, I, I, I wanted to add this, these preliminary results on the end here, just cause it shows how before I showed how the red band trout move at seasonal time scales so that they can exploit hypoxic habitats. And this is an example of fish moving at die yield time scales so they can seek refuge in hypoxic habitats during the day when thermal stress is the most severe. But we're still now trying to compare these data to data with free ranging radio tagged fish that had uh, temperature monitors in the radio tag to try to understand if the free ranging fish are also doing the dial vertical movements or if they maybe move more laterally to, to slight different temperatures. Well, I'm, I, I made it just under an hour. Thanks so much um, for bearing with me the whole way and let me tell you about all that work. And I wanna end with just three conclusions. The first one is that um, spatial heterogeneity in the phenology of prey resources is um, important for taxa across the world in prolonging the available, availability of ephemeral meals, feasts, just like we're about to get with Thanksgiving. And in the example of bears and salmon, we think it really strongly increases the amount of that, those marine nutrients from salmon that get to the upper levels of the food web. And secondly, although it's overlooked by climate change adaptation, seasonally warm and hypoxic habitats can still be important for cold water fisheries. And lastly, the, the kind of bullet that I think encompasses everything I talked about today is that 
Maps are awesome. I didn't mean to, to knock on anyone who makes maps because I'm a hypocrite. I used a bunch of maps in this talk. But I think we need maps that are repeated through time that eventually build toward movies if we're going to understand how landscapes function to sport fish and wildlife. And that's it. And then I'll just throw up my uh, thanks slide. And I'd be happy to take any questions from the audience, especially if they're easy questions. Need to go, feel free to. But if you have questions, yeah, please ask Johnny, take some from the room, and then ask what you Great, thanks for that, Johnny. Um, and, and going all the way back to the beginning with those bears, I so I can't get the images of those the salmon productivity moving around in the landscape out of my mind, and and I'm wondering, is there some dynamic interaction between bear predation? And that pattern, or are they totally independent? In other words, the bear yeah, yeah, yeah. really hit one little tributary really hard one year, and so abundances are down the next year. So they're moving that productivity around the landscape. That's a super good question, and that I don't, that I can't speak directly to. I've certainly never like analyzed that, but I will say that the whether it's true or not, I think like the feeling of like the field on it is that the bears aren't impacting the fish populations that much because most of them, they can't really get at the salmon until, they've, until they're pretty late in their spawning. Um, so it's only the smallest streams where they're able to actually like start preying on fish when they're still in the, when they just got in there and like the, and the females are spawning. So if it's not the bears then, what's moving the productivity around the landscape from year to year? I don't know. And, and I think, I think if you ask like the, you know, the people who, who really dig into that, like that's the main part of their research program, I think they would argue that um, it's, there's a bunch of factors that like can, that can come up in different years and they, and they're different factors in the different populations. And that's what creates the asynchrony. So it's things like, um, like for, for the ones that spawn along a lake shore, they're real sensitive to like lake level in the fall. So, so maybe um, just depending on the seasonal timing and precipitation, their, their egg nests might get dewatered. If it's a real small, low gradient stream, maybe a beaver dam is constructed and, and is there for seven years and goes away. Um, and, and, uh, but I think trying to unravel like the mechanistic under, underpinnings is, is really tricky. And that's why people are just kind of focused on the more emergent properties of the stability across the, across the portfolio. We have a question online from this Turkin says, are you considering water velocity in addition to temperature when considering habitat use and growth potential in river systems like the John Day? That, that's a great question. And um, here's one example of, of how we are and how we're trying to. So I talked about uh, Hannah and, and Gabriel who's here. Their work in the, um, in the Willamette. And so there, the fish that do move to thermal refuges, they move to those alcoves on the floodplain. And, and when they're not there, we exclusively find fish pretty much in riffles. Um, so like, you know, if you see that, um, the first riffle downstream, like the water treatment plant in Park, probably shouldn't be saying all this stuff, but whatever. Um, cut their chart really like that spot. Everybody who fishes knows that though. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm getting off track here. But so they move from high velocity riffles to completely different like still water habitats when they seek thermal refuge. And the ones that stay on the ripples, they are holding in these fast habitats and they're, they, they have much bigger rations when we puke them. They're chowing on caddis pupa and mayflies and, and golden stoneflies. Um, so they have full stomachs, but they're in fast habitat. So we're trying to understand like, well, why would any fish move to cold water refuge if you can survive in the main stem and have a full stomach? And we think that water velocity and temperature combine to explain it. So metabolic costs are higher when it's warmer and they're much higher. And that's just because of the temperature effects on, on your basal metabolism. But of course, they're also much higher if you're having to swim on this hydraulic treadmill to hold, hold still. So we think that the two strategies probably balance out because you're either eating a lot, but burning a lot of calories or just snacking on the occasional water boatman, but not burning that much up because you're just you're sitting in the ice bath and not eating. And so we're trying to figure out ways to quantitatively 
test that that hypothesis, but it's been kind of tricky. So that, that's a really good, really good question. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think this through in my mind, and I don't want to I don't want to sound like the, the barbarians of the game, but I keep thinking about the the climate change there and it's getting warmer and warmer, and of course we're always that's going to be a disaster. So so kind of is your data though showing that the the you know that the warm warm water isn't necessarily the horrible thing that I used to think it was for salmon, but is it going to screw them up? Uh, is, it, it's, is it very unpredictable? So if the water temperatures go up and they're trying to get out of that warm water, uh, I guess you could always say there's no, no cold water left. But you know, I wonder sometimes, and again, I'm not trying to be an apologist for this, but it's like that, that maybe it's not so bad that we think they'll just, they're going to adapt to that. They already have this mechanism. Uh, here we have this mechanism where they're moving from warm to cold water. Um, so, you know, if the lake, I guess, gets too, too hot, that would be bad. But I don't know. I'm just, I'm just trying to run it through my mind. Think, you know, I always think that the warm water is just going to kill everything. You know, they're just going to get wiped out. But it's interesting you're showing how uh, not that it's good, but it's not nearly as bad as maybe some people make it out to be, or, or, or we assume that it is. Yeah, and you know something pops on my mind when you're saying that made me think about it. I think maybe helps think about this. So the, those fish that are that are um, you know freshwater resident fish, they're migratory, but they never go downstream of the lake, right? They're able to they're able to make it work pretty well, right? By like because they can kind of they can sit upstream and then they see the lake getting better, or somehow I don't know how they know when to move, yeah. but they can just dip in and then they can get out when it gets bad. But it's trickier if you're like an anadromous, like the salmon that we're trying to restore right now. Yeah. They have to swim out through not only the lake, but what's actually even worse than the lake is the section of the Klamath River that's downstream of it. Um, that's just like a big, just, I don't want to say something unscientific, but it's like a cesspool of algae. It's got like no, literally no oxygen for like five months of the year, something like that. And so the trick is, I guess, so I guess the point we're trying to make is not necessarily that warm water is not going to be a dire threat to some, but we'll probably be able to anticipate better if we think about how it's patterned in space and time and, and what opportunities animals have to kind of game the system. So that, so they're like for salmon, having um, their migratory corridors be too hot for like huge stretches of the year for being hypoxic, that could be pretty brutal in some systems. Um, but at the same time, maybe they'll figure it out because like you said, they can adapt, they can alter their phenology. Yeah, they look like they're just fairly plastic. So maybe it'll be, you know, you know, uh, I don't know, spring run Chinook will be winter run Chinook. So I don't know, whatever, they'll, you know, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll move things around. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think the million dollar question is just, and this is something that I'm not, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but you know, just is there enough genetic variation and can they evolve? And then also how, how bad are we gonna mess that up with, um, with hatchery practices that have been so slow to reform. So that'll be an interesting th thing to see. Yeah. So in regards to the habitat compression that you were talking about the very end there, that's definitely something that's like hypothesized in the ocean with, you know, hypoxia and warm temperatures in the same way. And I'm curious if you hypothesize that prey preference for those fish may also change, like maybe, you know, getting a big juicy larva on the bottom is too risky and going into a hypoxic habitat maybe you want to stay and only eat prey that are also in this nice area do you think that you know there are other sort of ecological consequences to that new restricted habitat or have you yeah that, that's an awesome question and i was just i was just uh helping one of my students with a manuscript and i was like oh i know what the top topic of your intro should be the ecological side effects of refuge use, yeah. you know, and I think that's a super interesting question that, we're, that we haven't really gotten to. Um, and he was looking at um, those, those trout when they moved to the thermal refuges. He wanted to know if, if lamprey parasitism got more intense on them because in the lake, some of these fish look like when we were tagging them, they look like Swiss cheese. Like they had just these, it was so brutal, just gaping holes all over their body from a, there's an endemic uh, lamprey in upper Klamath Lake. It's not even really taxonomically described, 
but it was just going to town on these fish. And we, and we were thinking, well, when they get in these clear water habitats and are like not moving around as much, they must be sitting ducks. But we actually found that, the, or Jordan found that, that the lamprey parasitism dropped to virtually nothing when they moved to the refuges. But then this introduced, I think it's a copepod larnia, that that parasitism actually increased. So anyway, but anyway so that, that's kind of, kind of addressing what you're saying. Yeah. But I think it's super interesting to know how it's going to affect these kind of broader effects like um, predator prey dynamics. And I know, I think there's some evidence in the ocean that like some prey species will move into kind of like marginal hypoxic habitats to escape predators. Yeah, it's like a balance of like prey hypoxic tolerance and predator hypoxic tolerance. Kind of like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah, so, and honestly, if there's one thing that I think is just the most interesting thing to study, it'd be how all this kind of stuff then feeds into those kind of predator prey dynamics. And yeah, it's also like so frustratingly challenging to study, you know? Cool. All right, let's we'll do Francis and then wrap up. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the biology of the physics question. That there's water, there's a separate increases the partial pressure motion. And so it's, you know, partial pressure is good because that's the activity margins that you know, kind of constant concentration, more water should have more oxygen available to it. But the challenge has always been that sort of respiration. So do you see variation with that temperature scaling so that, you know, where biology actually doesn't meet the, the physics so that, um, oh, do you have those places where that scaling is it's shallower so that you actually realize the benefits of warming and oxygen? All right, so that's, first of all, I love like the direction of that question and trying to think about the interaction between the two. Now, I thought this is going to make me look very ignorant of, of physics and chemistry, but like, doesn't, doesn't the capacity for dissolved oxygen in water go down as it gets warmer? Yeah, so just mass constant. So just a jar of water, as you heat it, a closed jar of water, as you heat it, same mass of oxygen. But as, as it rises, the partial pressure function, so that, the activity, that gas molecule increases. So for someone that's exchanging gases, that's a good thing. I see, I see. Well, I think we should have a, we should talk about this more over beer. Yeah. But um, well, see, so what we were thinking, one of the ways that, that Jordan and I were thinking about it when he was thinking about the riffle stuff was um, can supersaturated water, like from, from, from dams or from, from photosynthesis, can that allow f fishes to endure higher temperatures? Because of what, what is that? The, the is it OLCT, the oxygen limited thermal tolerance? Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, the, the, the gill, gill oxygen limited tolerance. Um, but anyways, all that stuff is is that the these things are at the frontier of your knowledge, but they're in the core of others, you know. Um, but anyways, we think about this, and it's 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 super interesting. And also, like one question that I think I want to write a um, grant about is how do plants play into this? You know, so you take what would have been maybe like a static amount of oxygen in the environment, and then you start making it vary a ton because of photosynthesis and respiration. Is that better for, for fish in hypoxic environments because it makes it suitable during the day? Or is it outweighed because now it's more hypoxic at night? I think that'd be a super interesting kind of basic science question with potential implications for like restoration and things like that. Yeah, really good question that I'd like to unpack more. Oh, that's so perfect because I have things to follow up with you about, but we'll do it in that we're talking. All right, sounds awesome. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming. There's no seminar next week because it's Thanksgiving, maybe a short week. Uh, so get everything done. And then the next seminar, Bob Mason is my host. And for birds. Chris, 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 Chris,